We have a um, um, inclusion integration team here at Christ Lutheran that has been together for over a year. And we have done such things as uh, promoting classes for Wednesdays together in which we have brought in speakers from around the, um, the city here on a variety of topics. We, um, we helped put forth that 20-day uh, challenge, I think it was, was it 20 days? How many days it was? 21-day challenge, thank you. 21-day challenge with all sorts of resources. And as we continue to um, just to brainstorm ways in which we can continue to help Christ Lutheran reflect more the beauty of the diversity of the body of Christ. We have come up with this whole year-long series called An Awakened Faith, in which we can have a variety of topics to be able to um, talk about how we could be more intentional, diversity, inclusivity in a variety of ways. So the flow of these desserts, first of all, you have to get dessert. So we've got dessert over there. Kristen's picked up a bunch. She doesn't have any velvet. She does not have any <laughs> velvet cake. Um, you got plenty of that. So grab some. But the flow of this evening, we're going to have a speaker every month on the topic. They'll talk, I don't know, half hour, 40 minutes, however long they want to go. I uh, would take your time. And then they will ask some sort of a interesting probing question for us to talk about in our table settings. And then we'll have a panel discussion afterwards. Most of the time, we want to call upon people from our church when we can, but um, hopefully from our community here in Charlotte as well. So I am pleased to introduce our speaker for tonight, Dr. William Wright. He um, grew up in Rock Hill at Grace Lutheran Church. Any connections there? Got some connections. And uh, met his wife in third grade. They didn't get married that early, though. No, they didn't allow. Neither South Carolina. They didn't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then went to um, Charleston for school, uh, College of Charleston, got his um, BA there in biology, stayed there at MUSC for medical school, stayed there for his residency in psychiatry, stayed there for his fellowship in addiction within that field as well. So um, tonight, join me in welcoming Dr. William Wright. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, so not um, uncommon to, to get a point of speaking, but obviously, like everybody else, it's been a while, so I've got to knock the rust off. So bear with me today. And I appreciate you guys inviting me here uh, to talk about something, obviously, that's deeply, um, uh, obviously, part of my life, but also a passion of mine as well. Um, not just the field, but also getting to the public sphere and letting, us, let, letting others know um, about it as well. So when uh, Pastor Scott, you know, mentioned uh, this this talk series, I was definitely jazzed to hear about it, and especially kicking it off with mental health. One of those things that we typically uh, don't talk about a lot. Um, it's kind of one of those taboo subjects, like Pastor Scott said, born and raised here in the South. It was one of those uh, front porch rocking kind of conversations of, yep, your uncle's got some issues, and that was it. <laughs> All right. And you never talked about it again black sheep or whatever. So appreciate all of you guys being here, all of you guys online. Hello, sorry that you're seeing a big red blur. Um, and of course, um, my mom is also an art teacher, so I'm a very hopefully interacting. So there's gonna be some times where I'm gonna ask some questions of you guys. So definitely feel free to, to answer out loud, talk. Um, and then of course our discussion as well to converse and get some, get some things going and thinking about. So, there we go. Again, that's me. Um, they'll have me again for my, my um, teaching background. You know, the things that we have to talk about as far as obligations, I have nothing to report. Um, 
So they like to use me pretty often. I don't know if anybody knows who that was. That was me, obviously. So is this. <laughs> Some of my tougher roles. Um, <laughs> so obviously, I, I like to, to have some humor, but obviously, this is this is an important and very um, serious discussion. So there's also some things we want to think about. So today, hopefully, the, the goal being to discuss and learn some basics about mental health amongst us, um, but also identifying how mental health is excluded, even unintentionally, uh, within our own our ranks and, and, and within our own walls. And then, of course, brainstorming, how can we as a congregation, how can we as a community, how can we as a, uh, uh, just a people do better when it comes to, to mental health and those discussions? So, again, that interactive part that we talk about. So, first question, what comes to mind? What, do you, what kind of images, pictures, um, labels, words come to mind when y'all think of somebody with mental illness? Just shout them out. Depression. You Your depression. Psycho. Psycho. One flew over a cuckoo's nest. One flew over a cuckoo's nest. Um, crazy. Crazy. Easily, easily visible, um, odd behavior. Easily visible, odd behavior. And I repeat those for the folks that are online too. Outbursts. Outbursts. Suicidal. Suicidal. Anything else that pops into mind for folks? Narcissism. Narcissism. Dangerous. I wonder where that would come from. Dangerous. Dangerous. Because these are all great, right? Compulsive. Compulsive. Cutters. Cutters. Drugs. Right? Drugs. So as you see, there's a lot of stuff that just comes unbidden to our, our mind, even when we just mention the word mental illness, right? So some of the things, again, just quick Google searches of stuff, right? Anybody thought of that when they first thought of mental illness? This is a picture of somebody in a straight jacket and a padded cell. Obviously, um, not what we do anymore, but that's a mental image that, that pops up. Somebody mentioned this one, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Psycho. Anybody remember who this is? <laughs> Quick random fact. Anybody know how long Anthony Hopkins was actually on screen in that movie? This is how indelible that character is in our psyches now. Too long. <laughs> <laughs> that entire movie is only on screen 16 minutes. So that character of you know, somebody that you know has that those kinds of issues is imprinted in our brain. Mm. So I said drugs. And you, you might have this kind of image that pops in their head, somebody you know, intravenously using substances. And another quick, you know, um, just kind of question um, before we dive into some of this stuff, what is stigma? So you know, Miriam Depp, uh, Miriam Webster's definition of stigma is a marker of stain, right? We use the word stigma a lot, but that's that's the official definition is a mark or a stain. Why don't you kind of keep that in the back of your mind as we go forward? So again, I'm a very visual person. Like I said, my mom is an art teacher, so this is kind of how I think and how I, I, I uh, connect to the world myself. So when I typed in perfect family photo, <laughs> Yeah. So I remember that actually I was, I was talking to, to Dr. Laura. I think this is actually a, a pastor's family. I believe it or not. Oh, um, so <laughs> I didn't want to be anybody close to home. Um, it's like a good one, right? <laughs> so what, what do you guys see? What, what do you guys see in this picture? What's what's first impression? Happiness. Smiles. Smiles. Happiness. Teeth. <laughs> White gleaming teeth, right? Somebody had that word that I lost. I'm just saying. Perfectly posed. So the perfect stuff. You know, this is just what was that? Everybody's back. Everybody's back. <laughs> what if I was to tell you, you know, the, the husband here maybe has substance issues. His name is Mark. He's late 30s, um, got a good job in the banking industry, but unbeknownst to that smiling picture you just saw, he's got substance issues. Dealing with it, you know. Sometimes, you know, by himself, sometimes it, it bleeds over to the family, he misses <laughs> responsibilities, you know, he comes in late, wife, you know, wonders where he's, where he's at, <clears throat> hiding behind that, that picture of perfect smile that you just saw. Oops, ah, oh, no. Do you have permission to be showing this, this? This, this is a uh, theoretical. Okay, hypothetical. Okay. Yeah, this <laughs> is yeah. ah, sorry, me hitting the wrong button real quick, guys. Technology. Oh no, Zoom stop sharing. Um, hold on a sec, guys. 
Okay. So why my fingers should not be wearing There we go, back to it. So again, you know, um, some just imagery of, of substance use kind of stuff. So this gentleman, you know, unbeknownst to all of us from the outside in, um, you know, is having issues. So again, addiction is very, very prevalent in our, in our population. And again, the de definition, the very simplest uh, definition is a persistent compulsive use of a substance known by the user to be harmful. Again, typically when I give these talks, I also give the ASAM um, definition, which um, Dr. Lord can attest to, is pages long. So this is a very simplistic definition to a very, very, very complex issue. Explain ASAM. So yes, so the uh, American Society of Addiction Medicine is the, 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 one of the, the uh, bodies of, of um, uh, organization that deals with uh, addictions. The other one is the American As um, Association for uh, Addiction Psychiatrists, which is you know, um, what I'm a part of as well. So <clears throat> addictions in general. So substance use disorders in America, about you know 18 to, to 20 million folks, about one in 12, suffer from some sort of substance use issues. So if we're kind of breaking that down by the numbers, North Carolina has a population of about 10 million. So that's about 830,000 people just in the state of North Carolina. Charlotte has a population of 1 million. So again, that's 83,000 people in this city alone having an issue with substance use disorders that you don't know about. Or maybe you do. Maybe you know somebody. Maybe it's family. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe sometimes even it's yourself. Right? It is a common, common thing that we sometimes overlook um, and have stigma against. <clears throat> so 74% uh, of those folks had alcohol as their main uh, substance abuse. So again, very common, very um, uh, legal uh, if you're 21 and over. So it's, it's readily available. So only a couple of years ago in 2017, only one and a half percent received any treatment whatsoever. That's abysmal, guys. If we said that this, this um, illness of, of heart disease was affecting 83,000 people in this city and only one and a half percent were getting treated for it, what would we do? Hopefully we'd be in an uproar. Hopefully we'd say we need to get more treatment. We need to get more understanding. We need to do more um, charity work and, and drive to get more in, um, information out there. But it's not. Because again, that stigma, the mark, the stain of mental illness. So <clears throat> during, during this COVID uh, that we're all still, still going through right now, 13% of folks have said they've either started or increased substance use. That's a pretty drastic number. 13%. So again, back to our, our family, our perfect family photo. Let's let's go on to Susie, our, our, our mom here. So behind that smile, what if I told you that <clears throat> after the birth of her, her two lovely boys here, she had postpartum depression? Very common as well. Again, something we don't necessarily always talk about. Something that's not always mentioned. Something that's always sometimes as a mother, how many times I've heard, you know, well, I was having these feelings and I just felt such shame and guilt. And how could I not love this, this baby that, that I brought into the world when I'm feeling depressed and disconnected? So I don't want to talk about it. People are going to think I'm a bad mother already, right? The stigma of depression, of mental illness, the mark, the stain. So again, by the numbers in America, about 16 million folks, about 7% of the population, you know, are suffering from some form of depression. Uh, again, uh, that same population in North Carolina, so that's 700,000 people, it's almost a million people, and 70,000 here um, in uh, the, uh, the city of Charlotte. So again, uh, since we just had a nice victory for those of you who are watching the Panthers game, that's filling up that entire Bank of America stadium, and every single person there was having this issue. Again, visuals. So depression is uh, much more likely in, in women um, from what we're finding, about 70% more likely, but that doesn't mean men can't suffer from it as well. We do, obviously. Uh, about 35% of folks did not receive any form of treatment again for major depression. So again, in Charlotte, that'll be about 25,000 people not being treated for something that's treatable. And then of those folks, only six, about 6% 6 had medications only. Right, as, a, as, a, as a physician psychiatrist, obviously that's one of the things in our inventarium, but that's not the only thing, right? And so 6% of those folks are only getting medications, not getting therapy, not getting other forms of help as well. But 80 to 90% who seek treatment are successfully treated 
So again, there's hope. There, there's, there's the ability to, to get some, some help for these issues if we know what we're looking for, if we reach out our hands, if we recognize what's going on. The big ifs. So again, one of the things that pops up, obviously, with the question is the, the, the thoughts and the, the category of suicide. In 2019, it was the 10th leading cause of death overall in America. Right. Claiming lives of nearly 50,000 people. So one death in every 11 minutes. So again, very, that last, that next five folks at the end of this talk wouldn't be with us. It's pretty sobering thought, at least in my. Also, the second leading cause of, of death in the ages of 10 to 34. Who here is in that category? I think there's only maybe two of them over there. <laughs> but also the fourth leading cause in the ages of 35 to 54. Right, so it's, again, a very common thing that we don't want to talk about. And why is that? So it's also two and a half times more people die from suicide than homicide in 2018. We see homicide left and right on the news and the newspapers um, and all kinds of scare tactics from the news media. But two and a half times more people die from suicide than homicide. And, you know, part of this, this part is, you know, just talking about some of the, the different ways it can look in different populations, uh, age groups. Um, don't necessarily want to, you know, bore you guys with that, but just saying that this, this entity we call depression looks different. So what we may see in an adult of being sad and, um, and what we classically think of depressed isn't always what it looks like, right? And kids that can be anxious, clingy, they don't want to go to school. Older kids are start having trouble with school. They're having sulking issues, new eating issues, maybe substance uh, problems, increased sleep, increased appetite, easily frustrated, low self-esteem, restlessness. But as a teen, what does that sound like? Typical. Typical teenage years. It's true. So it's hard sometimes to tease out when there's an issue. But again, important. Young adults, middle age, just again showing that each age group has different characteristics of what that may look like. Right? So even though we all may have that, that image of what we think depression is, is for each of us, it's going to look different. I always tell folks, maybe a strange analogy, <clears throat> but I like to think of, of depression like ice cream. Right? Everybody knows what ice cream is. Like Baskin Robbins, there's so many different flavors, so many different ways that it can look for each and every single one of us. Right? Um, I always try to keep in touch with time. For those of you who are here and online, um, there was some, some videos that potentially we're gonna use, but I think in the essence of time, I'll probably skip those. But if you guys wanna see some of these videos, definitely um, feel free to ask me. I'll definitely be um, I'll more than happy to send some of these to you. I know it can't, it's kind of hard to see as well. Um, that mineral video was a great one. Um, Pastor Scott and I actually were talking about that, the black dog video from our, our friends across the pond. There was um, a great um, kind of, uh, website that somebody was kind of having a rolling discussion about what depression looked like for themselves. Um, and also the, the top one talking about somebody that themselves was talking about the stigma of depression. So going on again, using the same family, this, this uh, older son, you know, having some anxiety. What does anxiety look like? The most common mental health concern in America. Anybody ever had a touch of anxiety in this room? <laughs> I'm hoping I'm seeing honest, please. Everybody in this room should have had a, their hand raised, right? Because we've all had it. We've all had it, right? Um, tell folks that, you know, uh, in, our, in our American and just the Western culture that we are, have been told, anxiety is good or bad. Good or bad, what do you think? Yeah. Bad, right? Whatever I say, bad, right? Um, what if I was to tell you that anxiety is actually a natural part of our life? And then if we had zero anxiety, that would not be a good situation, right? But we're told, we're taught, we're shown, or beat over the head, that anxiety across the board is bad, right? So again, one of the reasons why it's the most common um, mental health concern in America, because we're taught that it's bad. If you have it, you should be getting help for it. You should in certain circumstances, but again, it can be natural. So again, 40 million, 40 million folks, about 18%, almost one in five folks are having anxiety issues. Again, in Charlotte, it's over 180,000 people. 8% of kids and teenagers have experienced the negative effects of anxiety in their home life or school. So again, you start seeing some of these anxiety issues, even arising in young kids, elementary school kids. And that's why I had one of our youngins here in this picture, be the one that had that. 
So some of the, <clears throat> the manifestations, common symptoms of anxiety, you have emotional symptoms as well as physical symptoms. Feelings of dread are due and feeling jumpy, irritable, waiting for the other shoe to drop. But as you can imagine, if it's starting a young kid, they may not be able to express some of those, those feelings that they have. So instead, they may talk about the physical. You know, they may have an upset stomach. They may not want to go to school. They may be short of breath, sweaty, clammy, headaches, fatigue. Anybody here, one of their kids have one of these issues like that? Test, the big test that's coming up. Oh, I want to get out of, get out of taking that test, right? Again, that's their anxiety coming through. So again, during, during our good old COVID, um, from that 2020 same report, 31% of uh, folks saying their symptoms of depression or anxiety um, were present. Um, about a quarter were stress-related as well. So lastly, for that same, that last little kid, Kyler, we'll call him Kyler, I don't know why. Bullying. Again, one of those things that is common, it can be there, that we don't always talk about, don't always see. The CD defines bullying as an unwanted aggressive behavior by another group uh, of use, um, not siblings, I thought that was always interesting, or current dating partners. Um, I guess they were thinking more domestic violence and that one. Um, that involves an observed or perceived power imbalance. I'm not going to, you know, uh, insult your intelligence by reading the rest. But who is it affecting? Everybody, both the kid that's bullying, the people that are bull bullied, uh, the folks that are watching, right? Um, and there's uh, tons of um, research that is, that's coming out now that's called adverse childhood events. And this is definitely one of those categories that is affecting kids, not just now when they're actually being bullied, but later on in their, their later years as well. Right? So again, it's not just an isolated, yeah, I got picked on as a ginger or redheaded kid as a, as a small one, but it's something that can definitely linger into adulthood. Luckily, I'm, I'm okay. What's the idea behind excluding siblings or current dating partners? That, I have to admit that, like I said, that was an interesting um, part of the definition for myself, too. So I think for the dating partners, then they will classify that as um, domestic violence with somebody that you're intimately involved with. The sibling, um, great question. Um, I, I got an older brother, and I definitely would say I got bullied by my brother um, quite often, like most of us probably do. Um, so I think probably some of it is also wrapped up in what is socially normative as far as having a sibling versus what's crossing the line. Right, as far as uh, behaviors go. Um, and probably would still talk about that being like family violence um, if we're to cross that threshold. If you're living with Correct. Correct. And of course, if somebody else has uh, more information on that, be, be happy to, to, to share that as well. But also thinking that there is actually no stereotypical bully, right? I mean, I know we sometimes think about the, the big tough kid in school that, you know, maybe doesn't have a very good home life. But that's, that's just, again, a stereotype. That's not really realistic. There is no profile. Anybody can be a bully, right? Um, even the folks that are bullied then sometimes can be a bully to somebody else. Right? So again, all these things, and again, you know, wanting to, to give us some time to have some discussions, but just, you know, the fact that 20% of the students from, you know, ages 12 to 18 are experiencing some form of bullying nationwide. That's, again, staggering. One in five kids are talking about some sort of bullying. And of course, you know, with the advent of these wonderful, sarcastic um, uh, inventions of, of uh, cell phones that are quote unquote smartphones, the cyberbullying with social media has also become rampant as well. So, at the last um, bullet, 15% of that same age group talk about being reported um, of cyberbullying or text bullying, which I don't know if anybody's ever called some of those stories can be horrific, leading to even suicides by some of these kids that have been affected by it. So I wanted to come back to that, that thought of stigma and what we're talking about. So that, that perfect family that we saw um, uh, as of the picture, covering up those things that are behind the scenes, those perfect smiles, that great, great pose, the stigma that we see and, and feel and, and have present in our, in our culture against mental illness. Do you think that prevents those folks from reaching out and getting help? Do you feel that like that's preventing anybody in this room from somebody that you personally know or family or friend has stopped them from getting help? I can say that for my own family, right? self disclosure right? But why is that? What is it about the mental illness that we, we are so afraid of? This is a little bit of the, the population and you guys uh, inter interacting. So, 
What do you think it is? What what is it about you know, the stigma of mental illness? Why why are we so afraid of think, talking about mental illness? I think we go right to the straitjacket or one flew over the cuckoo's nest. You okay. see those images of just way far to one side of you know but acting, a, of that kind of acting out behavior and that kind of response to that behavior. Fair. But there's a line uh, that the comment was um, the fear and, and the imagery of the one flew over cuckoo's nest, the padded cell with the straitjacket, um, and the acting out. Um, from unfortunately back in the day, how even the medical community perceived folks with mental illness and how we address those. And of course, we've come a long way, um, even from one flu or cuckoo's nest. If anybody actually knows, anybody know what that, that Chris, you can't answer, uh, what that treatment actually was by chance? Anybody know? Electric convulsive therapy. Electric convulsive therapy, ECT. Um, anybody ever seen a modern, e again, Chris, you can't say, anybody <laughs> seen a modern ECT treatment? I was about to say, I'm hoping you guys would say yes. So, so they, they will trust uh, somebody besides myself. Real quick, it, what did it look like? What did you, see, what did you guys see? So they sedate the patient, uh, they go in there and uh, get a creative seizure-like activity for about 20 seconds, it's quick. Uh, it doesn't last longer than that. And then, uh, and then it's kind of over. And they kind of go into recovery area and kind of wake up from the anesthesia there. Wait a minute, so you're saying they're not holding them down, they're not putting a, a rubber thing in their mouth and putting cuddles to their, their temples? Nope. Oh, man. <laughs> but again, you, you can imagine if somebody was to have that happen, I would understandably say absolutely not. But that is the, one of the furthest things from how it happens uh, nowadays. Yes, sir, your hand was raised. Now, yeah, only from the standpoint of there are some therapies where they do uh, use of elect electrical stimulation as part of the types of physical therapy. Fair, you know, um, working with EMGs and those kinds of things as well, um, biofeedback kind of mechanisms. But if that was to be the, uh, the case and you're inducing a seizure with nothing going on, I absolutely would be like, that's barbaric. Uh, but also remembering we've come a long way um, from even Freud um, and just sitting on a couch um, and talking about issues. Um, we've come a long way from lobotomies, right? So the, the advancements in mental health treatments have come a long way. But again, unfortunately, our um, culture has not kind of kept up with that. Well, so we still have this stigma uh, against being treated for it. Because like we said, it's one of those things. Anybody also ever think weakness when I hear mental illness? Yes. And does anybody else ever want to admit they're weak? I don't, right? But does that really mean that you're weak? I think about, I think about Simone Biles. That's great a great point. example of or an anti-example because she's so brave in admitting what she went, she and her colleagues uh, went through over the years. So um, for those online, the live audience was talking about a um, great example of being able to come forward and say that some of the issues is Simone Biles. I think we all kind of heard, you know, her struggles during these past Olympics and that. Um, but I have to admit, even that had so much uproar. Um, you're just you're the fetus, you should suck it up. I'm still not gonna lie, even in physician, you know, um, uh, social uh, groups I'm in, even doctors will still say that you should quote unquote know better, right? So, again, it's still it's still ever present, there's still like concrete shackles holding us down from, from getting help for folks, and just huge family shame. Huge I mean, family shame. Uh, yeah, I mean, as recently as you know, the Kennedys had one of their daughters lobotomized and never said her name again. It's just, it's, it's, it's the family shame, absolutely. So, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, there, as Christians, you, you think about the Lord's strength being made perfect in our weakness. So, yeah, I think uh, we stand on pretty good ground in being able to admit weakness. So. Very true. Right. And so, again, uh, we'll, we'll hopefully come back to, to that same kind of uh, concept uh, when we finish our discussion as well. So, real quick, you know, some of the, the common stigmatizing phrases that, again, I'm guilty as an next person, I'm human, of sometimes throwing out there. But just the more we are aware of sometimes how words that come out of our mouth, even inadvertently, can affect other folks, it makes us a little more aware and a little more um, open to maybe I shouldn't say that, maybe I should rephrase things. Uh, again, not trying to. to to say anything against our culture, but again, when folks are struggling with these issues and they hear these phrases coming out of other folks' mouth, it definitely can be 
even further stigmatizing and hurtful. So I'm so OCD. What do, what do we typically mean by that phrase? Anybody? Anybody? Okay. What was it? Obsessive. Obsessive. So I'm just really nitpicky, right? I'm just OCD. I want it exactly right, right? But somebody that actually you know struggles with OCD, it's anything but, right? You know, sometimes they're they're literally can be you know washing their hands until their hands bleed because of some compulsions that they have to stay clean because something else bad is going to happen if I don't, right? But if they're seeing somebody that again appears perfectly normal, saying those kinds of things, and it's kind of belittling what they're struggling. With. Right. I can't focus. It's my ADD. You might said those kinds of things or heard that. My ex girlfriend, boyfriend is such a psycho. Right? They're crazy. And sometimes probably even stronger language of that. Right. Um, man, she was just happy a minute ago. And now she's kind of ticked off. Man, she must have got bipolar. Have I ever said one of those? Or that makes me want to kill myself. Again, some of these phrases that appear to be throwaways to us aren't throwaways to other people. Somebody that's actually had those thoughts come through their head, their mind, their heart. People have actually acted upon those when they hear these kinds of phrases. Stop being so paranoid, right? They're not out to get you, stop being paranoid. <clears throat> I'm so addicted to that show, Below Deck, being one of them, maybe my wife. Um, <laughs> But somebody that actually has a substance use issue hearing this and the struggles they go through every single day with that substance. And somebody trivialize what they're going through with being really enamored of a TV show. That's insane. So when you hear these things out loud, who's, who's ever uttered one of these? <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be honest here. But just something to think about. When we, again, we keep talking and come back to that, that stigma problem, how these things can further further stigmatize um, what we think, what we feel, how we address these, these issues. So other actual ways that we can, we can think about. Um, reducing stigma. Encourage equality between the physical illnesses and the mental illnesses. Right? Again, like we said, back in those statistics slides that I showed you, if we had another illness that had some of those statistics, what would we all be doing? We would have fundraisers, the ice bucket challenge, right, to raise money. Well, but it's no illness. Pull yourselves up by your bootstraps. Take care of that by yourself. There's no compassion. There's no compassion for it, right? But as I said, show compassion and love for those who, who have mental illnesses or some sort of um, mental issue going on at a given time. Again, like you're doing today, educate yourself about uh, mental health and about others going through that. So again, I applaud each and every one of you for being here today and online as well. Talk openly about mental health, like we're doing still here. Don't be shy. Uh, I think we've come a long way as far as being able to talk about things like depression, anxiety, but there's still a long way to go. And even certain things are still more taboo. I would say substance use is still kind of on the, the back burner when it comes to that. Try not to label or stereotype people with mental illness. Again, with those, those stereotypical cliche phrases that we were just talking about. Be a positive mental health role model. So I'm always telling folks, you know, thank, thank them for coming to see me and, and, and getting help. And especially if they've got family members or you know, you know, young children, I always tell them and encourage them and validate them saying, I think one of the best things that you're actually doing is showing that, hey, there's something going on and I got help for it. I'm ongoing getting help for it. We don't, we don't besmirch somebody for going to the doctor to get their diabetes. We shouldn't be doing that for mental health either. Don't use disrespectful terms when you talk about people with mental health. Again, going back to that last slide. And then choosing empowerment over shame. Again, there's nothing weak. There's nothing shameful. There should be nothing guilt about any of these things at all. But again, we've been taught that over and over and over again by society, by media, by how it's portrayed, that again, it should not be talked about, it should be kind of shunted to the side. So again, you know, kind of like, uh, as we mentioned, talking about treating mental illness similarly as we treat physical illness. Sorry, if we did, uh, if we treated other ailments like mental illness, this cartoon, geez, cheer up, have you tried not being in a coma? <laughs> <laughs> just, just that easy, right? Do we ever do that? 
or again, you know, you should go get that checked out. Like, that, there's something going on there. But if you have an illness, oh, just just think happy thoughts. You're gonna be okay. And again, you know, some of these other um, really interesting um, uh, websites and links um, that we, you can look at um, a little bit later. Um, but also, there's a stigma against folks that are in the mental health field, right? Has anybody um, besides here hearing me speak ever heard a psychiatrist or psychologist, counselor, therapist talk before? No comment. <laughs> Sorry, I was talking about the, the, the meds a bit there. Yeah. Um, so when you all think of a psychiatrist, like psychologist, and mental health uh, professional, what do you guys think of? Drink. Drink. <laughs> wow. Mom. Yeah, mom. The mom. Okay. Anybody else? Anything else? Bob Newhart. Bob Newhart. <laughs> <laughs> I still. I, I, I'm connected. Anybody think of uh, again the Freudian? You know, somebody's laying on a couch, talking about problems. Right. Anybody think about this? Just about the pills, just about the medications. And of course, like we said, anybody afraid of this? Well, I can tell you for, for one, um, I probably do more of this without the couch. I use those, but not to that extent. And yeah, I've never done that. So again, just hoping to, to open up conversations with folks, even about you know, folks that are in the field, um, of what we do, how we do it. Um, but one of the, the, the main gist for, for today, and I'll leave this lot there in case you might need to, is trying to open up the, the eyes, the minds, the hearts uh, for folks here in this room, online, to sometimes think about that the inclusivity that we're talking about here is starts at home. Right, like a lot of things, it starts at home, starts within our own walls. If we're not able and willing to accept, open our arms, help folks that are within our own uh, families, both our physical family as well as our <laughs> church family, when they're having issues, it's going to be near impossible to help those that are in our community, open our arms, our, our doors to folks out, outside of these walls. So like that picture, hopefully kind of bringing it home is that it's here. Whether you guys realize it or not, it's here. There are folks that are suffering from depression, from anxiety, from bipolarity, from schizophrenia, from substance use issues, bullying. I mean, you name it, it's here. And being willing and understanding what that means like, what it means to be like for them, but also understanding that they're just like us too. They are us. And being able to understand that, that there's, there is no difference between the physical illness and the mental illness kind of stuff as far as how we should be thinking about it and how we should be going about it. Opening up our minds and our hearts to help folks when they're, maybe that veneer of the perfect family cracks and we finally get to see. And somebody's willing to finally reach their hand out. Not saying, oh, suck it up, man. You got a perfect family. You should, there should be nothing you should be worried about. You should not be depressed at all. Instead, how can I help? What do you need? I'm here. You want to talk? So um, I know I've gone over a little bit um, as far as the time goes, but I kind of wanted to wrap that back in. But also for our discussion, I kind of wanted to, to leave you guys with some things to think about at your tables before we, we come back to the panel. Um, first one, again, being totally honest with ourselves and hopefully with our table mates, um, what thoughts or statements have you guys ever had about mental illness, kind of like those those stigmatized words. Okay, that's number one. And then a more global, how can we do better? How can each, each one of us individually do better? And then ideas as far as how our congregation can do better, our community do better. Because obviously I don't got all the answers. I, I never claim to. So this definitely has to be um, solutions that come from everybody. So how can we all do better? How can we help those that are struggling? With mental illness. So I'll leave you guys with that unless you have any other comments before we kind of break off into discussions. Um, a little time limit, you know, 15 minutes. 15 minutes. All right, I'll come back and, and uh, get everybody together. So thank you guys for, for listening. Thank you guys for the questions. And of course, you know, we'll be having some more questions at the end as well.
If we unmute and talk, maybe they can't hear us. Hi, David. Hi, Ron. Hey, Amy. I started typing and thought, I don't want to type. That's a lot of typing. Yeah. That's a lot of typing. So if anybody else that's online wants to join us, you're welcome to unmute. You know, in my own family, there's been substance abuse. And then we had a foster son with mental illnesses. And it made me start being aware every now and then when I'd say something and think, you say that around them. And it's like, oh, he's right. I shouldn't say it at all. Yeah, that's a great point, Amy. A little bit about that too. We we've, we've been sort of flipping about some things that we say sometimes that we should be more sensitive to, not really knowing the people that we might be around in their experience. Right. So much of it you don't see. Um. You know, I was thinking when Pastor Scott was preaching this morning, none of us are A-list people. If you scratch just a little below the surface, we all have some reason that we shouldn't belong, don't belong. There are not an awful lot of us that think we're A-list people. But I know that I'm no better than anybody else and certainly don't have my life together better than many people. And we're all on a journey. Agreed. Agreed. But these were always the thing that, uh, at least I remember, within the family, my grandmother, God rest her soul, we don't talk about them. Right. I mean, she would even whisper it if it was just me and her in the room and, and nobody else in the house. You know, you know, if somebody. Nowadays, we look at it in the middle of the Right. So the stigma, self-imposed self and yeah. Yes. And it, all the topics we're going to talk about, it, it's some of the same, one way or another. Anybody else want to unmute and speak? We welcome you. Hear me? Barely. Who is that? Oh, this is Olivia. Hi, Hello. Olivia. Hi. By chance, could you mute facilities or uh, either Mr. Wright or facility schedule or which one ever we're getting hearing so much of the room in? Are you the host? I I don't know. I'm not the host. Okay. Never mind. I think, it, I think it's Thomas. Oh, I could text him. Um, I'm doing what that were you right say, now. Olivia? Hi, Bill. Oh, um, I'm not sure. I was going to say something really, but then I lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. No, that's fine. Hey, Bill. How are y'all doing? Doing well, thank you. Good. I hardly recognize you these days. <laughs> I hear that. <laughs> I hear that a lot, I'm sure. 
You hear that a lot. Yeah. So, um, I kind of missed the question right here. It's around bedtime in my house. So, oh. Um, but I've, I've, what is it? What's the main thing that I want to get? So the, the question is about when have we used the phrases? When have we been unaware or un insensitive? And how can we be better? What does the church need to do to be better? Um, you know, I know the pastors talk a lot about being sure that what they say up front doesn't include and doesn't exclude people and that it's hard um but they're trying i i hear in the prayers more often things about those with this or those in with depression specific depression um you know not trying to raise that awareness of sensitivity to as opposed to stop yeah. that crazy talk uh, yeah so examples and advice and brainstorming on how we can be better. I don't know that I have a ton of uh, input here, but I'm constantly like that with you know, kids. Um, there's a lot of things that I have to catch myself on how I say it because I get certain reactions. And, um, so I try to remind myself and, uh, next time, try to play, you know, and be a little more, or a little more grace filled, and you know, thinking about church work. There are a lot of times I know a lot of church staff have those moments where they they really do want to say what they want to say, you know, but we have to catch ourselves. We have to show that grace. And, um, you know, I think just taking a step back and just remembering that they're having a day too. Yeah. You know, that's kind of what helps me. Um, I, and, and I think it makes for better relationships and, and those things uh, better out all around. So. Yeah. Oh, I, think it's a, I think it's a journey. I don't think it's perfect. I don't think we're always going to all get it right all the time. No. And um, we have to, you know, but like you said, Bill, um, you know, when it does happen, it's good to remind ourselves maybe, maybe I shouldn't have said that next time I'll do better. You know, I don't think anybody is trying to, got to, to get us on this or to try to. Or, or that we are having to watch and be guarded with everything we say, but I think that when we know better, we do better. So we keep trying. I mean, it's, it's not like it's going to all of a sudden get fixed. It's just something we have to work for. That's for sure. That's right. The statistics, I was thinking about the statistics that I'm um, mentioning in um, in the different age groups and thinking about the, the people that are members at Christ, you know, what does that sort of shake out for us at Christ? How many people fall into those categories considering the number of people that are members that attend? How many people maybe we have no idea or suffering, suffering with depression, substance abuse, or whatever, you know, whatever mental illness it may be, oftentimes we're probably sitting in church with them. Next. That's a great idea to bring it down from Charlotte to Christ Lutheran. And, and we could do a, a newsletter article to follow up on what he said to get it out and then recommend the the video of this or something. I don't know. Because um, I know it would make probably those with some of the issues feel better. You're not alone. You're not right. the only one at Christ Lutheran that way. 
statistically, right. there are probably there's probably a small group of you or a big group of you that could encourage each other. It's, it, nobody wants to be alone. Right. But admitting these kinds of things is a sign. I mean, we still think that this is a sign of weakness. Right, and it's a sign of strength. I know for me, I have um, a family member that is celebrating just 15 or 16 years of sobriety. And it, and it's like, happy birthday. That's something to celebrate. Um, so if we can get that idea across that it's not weakness. It takes strength to work for help. Um, I've got a question. Can you hear me? Yes. My question, this is Hank. My question is, you know, not everybody, I, 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 Amy, I know you mentioned that it's a strength when you uh, basically you know, humble yourself and tell the truth about something. But the, the recipient or the person that's listening, you know, they get you crazy, <laughs> you know, and and the other face. And, and, and I, I can I can deal with someone that's not of the face, but someone of the face. You know, how do you deal with those things in, in the most uh, respectful way? Um, I agree with you. It's very disappointing when it's your church that says something that you know, or a representative of your church, or just. You know, in the name of Christianity, a, a lot of horrible things have been said through the years, and a lot of horrible things are done. Um, so we have to be able to call it out, and then we have to confess it, um, acknowledge it, and and then try to do better. Um, but we Christians are a sorry lot of sinners. We are as much sinner as we are saint. I know. Um, yeah, our history doesn't bode well for us um, in some ways. But that's. I know it's like a broad question. I just, just kind of wanted to throw that out there. Yeah. Yeah, it's very difficult. How do we grow? And, and if, 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 if the body is broken and someone on the outside looking at the broad body broken on the inside, do you think they want to be part of that body? Exactly. No, I know I wouldn't want to be. Yeah. So then we have to say if, if, if we're trying to be better, we want to be better than this. Yeah. Um, I love, there's a Martin Luther quotation about this life, therefore, it's a journey. But we have to acknowledge that we make mistakes. We're on the journey and we are trying. And it looks like he's about to re enter. All right. Thank you. But hopefully, you guys have also in the background been you know, thinking about uh, like your own experiences uh, and your own um, things that we may have been thinking or said out loud for yourself too. We're about to, to come back all together uh, and maybe share some of the things we talked about. So. Yeah, talking about our online peeps. Good deal. All right, there, there's two uh, resources there being passed out. One is um, for this session here, going deeper, a lot of different resources on the different topics that Will talked about. The second one, it just happened that this past week, um, Matthew's United Methodist Church has this brochure here that they uh, passed out to different churches, including Christ Lutheran, and I said I would distribute it here. So they're going to be meeting with October, November, December, uh, I think once a month there to talk about these very issues. So um, you can take a look at those two, two things. So I want to bring up a couple others for our panel. 
we have um, another psychiatrist here, um, Chris, Chris Lord, come on up. And uh, from a different perspective, we've got a family therapist, uh, Kimberly, come on up, Kimberly Mangle. Um, she, uh, she actually helps me a lot with uh, our pre-marriage counseling going on here with her extensive work with, um, um, with marriage dynamics and such. So we we'll have to figure out how to, where's that, um, that little microphone, that little, um, the job row right over here so people can hear online. So I don't know, maybe just to kick this off, uh, maybe hear from both Chris and Kimberly, have um, or how has your um, your practice um, seen any changes during these 18 months of COVID? Do you want to start again? No, you go ahead. <laughs> hey everybody, I'm Christopher Lord, and I'm a psychiatrist like Will, and I've been coming here for a long time. Can you? Oh. You can take it off. Take it off. Am I easily heard? Can you hear me okay? Yep. And I'm Christopher Lord. I'm a psychiatrist like Will. And uh, I've been just seeing, and I see a very similar patient group. And so, of course, been working during the pandemic. And I had lots of thoughts about the, the great presentation that was done. So stigma is definitely there. It's going to be there for a long time because people are people. But if I see anything, I see the stigma being less than it ever was right now. I mean, it's, and it seems to be getting better and better, like less stigmatizing. So people can now go to, you can go to cocktail parties and say, you know, you're on, you know, you take, you know, Adderall or something. And it's not the same negative stigma that it may have been years and years and years ago. You know, and you can, you can talk about your child having autism or Asperger's and these kinds of things. It just doesn't have the same impact anymore. So even though stigma still is a real thing and, and, and you know, a barrier, I don't even view it as the most potent barrier. There's 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 bigger there's bigger barriers than that, and it's just access to care. Like it's 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 so regrettable. Like psychiatry as a specialty is is another one that's just underserved. There's more people than there's more people that need help than we can help. I mean, I get calls for new patient appointments every day, and the wait time is almost two months. And that's in a very small, I mean, I've got a very small private practice. I mean, it's a solo office. And I can't, I, that's too long to ask somebody to wait if they're really in trouble. Eight weeks is, it might as well be forever. So, um, so despite the stigma and just everything else, people are much more willing to admit they've got some issue. And sadly, there's just not enough people to, to be helpful. Something good has happened during the pandemic. I mean, telehealth has started. And, I never was a telehealth provider, so um, but I learned it while I was while I was you know doing all this stuff, and now my 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 reach has been expanded, and I've taken on patients who I probably wouldn't have because they're in Winston Salem, and that's a long drive, and you know we have to see them in person at some point, but it's just way easier to do that. So that's actually you know some some plus to this. And, you know, despite everything, despite all the negative stuff, I, I have tons of encouraging stories. I mean, the, the patients that I had going into this that were largely doing okay, they're, they're still largely doing okay. And it's not because of me. I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not the one doing it. You know, they had a good plan going in. They had good supports and everything was, you know, and they were definitely rocky, challenging times, but they, they pulled through. I see a lot of folks who have addiction, like Will does, and you know, AA is a thing and it meets in churches and they meet face to face. They've been meeting for a long time and, uh, and all that kind of shut down for a while. And I've had patients get sober during this pandemic who never went to an AA meeting. They've still never gone to one and they're a year plus sober, which is just, it's just amazing. And it's really what God does. We're talking about, you know, at the table, you know, I think God is responsible for the people's recovery. I'm just there and I ask to be helpful. And some days it works, you know. But God does the work, and he's still doing the work right now, despite everything going on around us. So anyways, so I have, I have more encouragement maybe than discouragement. And that's what we can do. You know, that's what we can do. We can focus on what's encouraging. I'll give people a chance to do, you know, things, small things for, you know, for a good reason. For instance, like, I, you know, like I'll, talk, I'll call a patient. Hey, can I move your appointment from 4 to 4.30? It'll help me see somebody else. So like, you bet. 
I'm like, great, that helped me help somebody. And it just makes them feel good. So small things like we just, you know, small things, everyone's really tense right now. I, I, I never really used my horn very much because I'm from Texas and you don't want to do that because it's just not a good idea. You know, there you are. So I never use my horn much at all, but I, but I really don't use it much at all anymore. Like even, like even minimally now, everyone is really tense. Everyone's really tense. So I give a smile where I can and I encourage people every chance I get. And it's not hard to find encouragement in some people's stories. I mean, there's something small, like, hey, we went a whole month without drinking. That's awesome. You know, like, you got to find something in there. And it's, it's, not, it's not that hard. But I, I think that that's kind of where it starts. And we can all do that. Has there been an increase in anything such as anxiety, depression, abuse, addiction? Is there, have you seen any change in, your, in the course load? Family. Family strain. You know, I you know I, I have all the respect for you know frontline COVID workers and, and first responders and all that, but you know, in in my world, the I, I don't work in hospitals anymore. But the first line response right now are the moms, the moms at home. They're taking up a lot of extra work. I have a lot of concern for them. You know, I was jokingly telling, uh, telling Dave at the table there, you know, I'll talk to my patients, and many are, many are men, and I'll say, hey, how are things going at home? You guys doing okay? And uh, the answer will be, my wife's really stepping up to the, she's really stepping up to the plate, doc. She's doing great. And that just means, that, you know, she's taking on a lot of extra work. So I listen, I listen for, I always talk to the moms and see how they're doing. And I think they're the ones that are facing the biggest strains of homeschooling and, you know, um, just everyone's at home working on top of each other. I've had appointments by telephone and in closets where <laughs> my patient, only place my patient could get away was in the closet. And then, you know, we would be joking, but there'd be, there'd be you know, her daughter's hand would come under the closet door, you know, just put the fingers under the door. It's just, there's just no privacy and just, so it's, it's really hard. So I listen, I, I, I look at, I look at how COVID will impact everybody. Cause of course I don't see children, but I, there's no doubt it impacts them in all kinds of ways. But for a man, his wife, for a wife, her husband, and I'm just always looking at just where's, where's the strain in the family unit. So that's different for this. Great question. Anyone else? I'm Kimberly Mangel. I have a private practice in Pineville Church here in Charlotte. As Pastor Scott mentioned, I do a lot of premarital work. My primary area of focus is women's issues. I do a lot of work with eating disorders as well. A um, couple of things that I've noticed throughout the course of this pandemic, just with my practice, and uh, these gentlemen had mentioned, obviously, telehealth. I never was a big fan of that, but I think what's happening is more and more people are coming out of the woodwork and making it okay and saying, you know what, I, I do need help. Um, I have a lot of contracts with EAP providers, with different companies here. I work with a lot of Charlotte um, CMPDs, firefighters, EMT workers, and people that have been saying they've been going along being so strong are now finally acknowledging that some of this stuff is bothering them and recognizing that it's okay to come out and seek some help. And I think companies are getting more to a point where they're recognizing it and really taking note of it as far as noticing some difference in maybe work performance or productivity and really wanting to help their employees um, address those issues. One of the things that I was talking with my husband earlier was we were I listened to a lot of Andy Stanley's podcast. One of the things that he had quoted in there, and it wasn't his quote, he was like, I wish I would have said this quote because it was so amazing. But he mentioned another pastor and the name slips my mind, but, and it boils down to what I've seen in this pandemic. And his quote or his reference was that if you don't deal with your demons, they will go down to the depths of your soul and begin to lift weights. And one of the things that I've recognized is that things that have been buried, dismissed, overlooked, maybe childhood trauma, marital issues, um, as they mentioned, working with your kids, um, you know, we've been home and we've been in close quarters. 
Um, if there have been issues before that have been not addressed, those issues are rising to the surface and there's no way to escape them. And I think what I've been seeing is people finally coming in and saying, gosh, like I've been able to manage it up to this point, but now my symptoms are so bad, my depressive symptoms or my anxiety, or I never knew that I had OCD and it's impairing their daily functioning. And it's, um, like they were talking earlier, celebrating those small wins. You know, I, I'm working with a couple of women on my caseload right now that I'm thinking of that, you know, getting out of bed and getting their kids out the door on time for school or simple tasks. It's like, let's celebrate those wins because they really are when you're looking at severe mental illness um, and just really helping patients recognize that progress is progress. As long as we're moving forward, that is what counts um, because they, they come in and they think they have this timeline of, I gotta be better by X, Y, and Z, right? And it doesn't always work that way, you know, with the help of medication and with therapy, much more success, success rates. But like these gentlemen mentioned, um, there's way more people than we're able to serve. And so even with my caseload, I've had sometimes a waiting list or um, being able to manipulate my schedule during the week, trying to fit everybody in. So there's definitely work to be done here, not only in the church community, but um, one of the joys that I have is working with premarital couples and kind of identifying specific things and what do you do to build a strong foundation because it really does start at home and us being our own advocates for our own mental health and for noticing and doing a self-check. So we're living a soul aligned life. And what does that mean? What does that look like as far as where I was at or where I'm going? And am I a forward thinker? Um, and so just helping really navigate through that um, and have a path of where they know they want to be going and how close are they in getting there. How many questions from the table? I have a question. Yes. Um, so I think we've been talking about stigma. Um, and I think it's easy to look at how society stigmatizes mental illness, but we're at a church, so um, I think it would be important to look at how the church stigmatizes it. And if you look at the church's history, there's been a lot of speculation that, you know, demonic things in the Bible were actually people with mental illness and that they were cured with prayer or casting demons out and things like that. Um, and, you know, you get this idea of exorcisms, and even more currently, we see churches praying over, like, gay people or people experiencing, like, gender dysphoria disorder. Um, so what I want to ask is if someone comes up to you and says, I'm depressed or anxious, instead of saying, oh, you need more God or you need more prayer, um, how can we support them in getting resources like seeing a psychiatrist or medication. I'll answer. Sure. You want to repeat the question? <laughs> well, yeah. So yeah, for online folks, a great, great question. Um, trying to think how to quickly sum up. Um, obviously, the church's history, as well as mental health uh, history, you know, having um, you know thoughts of demonic possession or other other uh, uh, potential explanations for, for what we may see nowadays as, as a mental illness um, and how we as the current congregation and church um, will be able to foster more folks getting the appropriate help they're needing, including things like uh, seeing mental health professionals. So, it's, a, it's a great question and an old one. And the, the way I approach it is I, I, I remain neutral to the best of my ability when I'm meeting with someone and I'm listening to their problems, I remain neutral and I see what, like what, what, what part of their identity is speaking. And identity is a, I mean, it's a psychological concept, but it's not a hard one to grab. It's the way you, it's the, it's the assumptions or the beliefs you have that just kind of dictate or organize your behavior. So I'm a Christian, so I do these things and I don't do these things. That's like a Christian identity. So. I listen to somebody and they can have they can have their identity organized around being a father 
um, and a Christian, but or you know, an employee or a brother or a sister. So I listen to their their orientation. Are they are they, are they coming at you with a Christian, you know, with a Christian orientation? And do they want to grapple with that problem using that identity or using that way? So you 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 listen to them and you know it's you listen as a, as a psychiatrist and you know and that means you listen for all the different parts talking and you address the ones you can like I'm not a I'm not a pastor so I, I can't address all spiritual things I do what little I can but when I but I know they need more help I I move them on I'm not a marriage counselor so I don't offer that kind of help but I whatever rudimentary help I can offer I will but then I'll find someone else to help them, you know, if they have eating, if they have an eating disorder, and that's the most prominent thing. I look for all the other problems that can come with eating disorders, and I treat the ones I can, but refer them out for, you know, nutrition support specialists. So, again, it's an, it's, it's an old problem, and the solution to, again, to remain neutral, I think that's what's lost. I think, you know, I think that's, it's an old solution, but it just gets forgotten. So, I like to come back to it where I can and, and, and say these things. It's really important. You're, you're the medical student, right? So this is a really important lesson to re just listen with neutrality. And that's, that's how I was taught. And that was the old way to do it. And it's still a pretty good way. And we've kind of lost that these days, if you think about it. So we can all do better there. I can do better there. Um, <clears throat> from your I'll just jump in and say, you know, I think also as like everything, as we learn and as we grow as both um, the general people and also as, as people of God as well, we, our definitions of things do change over time and what we understand about um, the world and how things work changes over time as well. Obviously, we can still um, uh, utilize and, and, and learn from, from stories and parables. That's why we we all still come here every single every single Sunday. Um, but as, as Chris was saying too, you know, being able to then understand you know, in the con in the construct of what we now um, uh, know and, and see, there's other alternatives. There's other things we can do to help. It's not always about an exorcism, though. If somebody you know, like I think Chris is in neutrality, if that is helpful for somebody, I'm not necessarily going to stand in the way from that uh, as long as I know it's not going to hurt them. Right. If it's something that we know that's going to be actually uh, detrimental to somebody, you know, I, I'll definitely step in and speak up. Um, but again, as far as that, that construct and what folks um, have as their, their core beliefs and, and what they, they believe in, um, and then also trying to um, educate them as far as what we also know about modern issues and how that affects folks and how we can also help in a modern sense. So somebody that may um, still really want to have um, uh, be prayed over. Absolutely. But also saying, well, in addition to that, there's also some, some things we can do as far as uh, talk therapy, psychotherapy to kind of address some of the, the, the way that we're thinking that, that then leads into different behaviors. And then if, if, if necessary down the road, maybe there's, there's something medication-wise from a biological standpoint that might be helpful as well. Again, I'm a very um, therapy-first, you know, medications if we need it kind of uh, individual as well um, because they have their place in their time, but it's not always. So it's, it's like uh, Chris was saying, you know, Dr. Orr was saying, you're incorporating that into that neutrality of seeing the person as a whole um, and hopefully then getting them the resources that they need. So they may still find, find benefit from what you're saying, um, you know, from, the, from their own um, family values and core beliefs kind of stuff, but then also um, encouraging them to consider other alternatives that can be helpful as well. And that's, I think, where you're saying, how can we do that? Making sure folks hear the resources I think I, I, I changed the, the slide. Making sure they're aware of those resources that are both here locally as well as, as nationally. Um, so that way it's not just you know, that exorcism or, or prayer kind of stuff. Again, it's an addition to that would be, would be my take. I don't have anything else to add. Okay. You guys did great. <laughs> yeah. I got a question about, I guess, generally about healthcare delivery in the United States and our healthcare system, which I think in the last year and a half, we've seen that it's broken in a lot of places, the way we deliver health care in the United States. And in particular, if we could speak about the delivery of mental health care. Uh, and I'd like you to talk about how the insurance industry and public health policy may have been complicit in this uh, inequity you see between the way we deliver physical health care and mental health care. 
Do we have another two hours? <laughs> or more? It's, it's frustrating as a general physician when we say, have a patient who needs your care. And you know, often all we can tell them is call your insurance company and see who you can see. And you're on to the next patient. Okay, first, uh, if you like, sure, I can tell you. So, yeah, um, so for the, the folks online, uh, it was a question about how the, the current medical um, system has kind of, uh, for lack of a better word, kind of stacked the deck against uh, folks getting mental health um, because of different issues, uh, including from insurance panels. Um, so I think that's where you know, the attempt recently as far as uh, mental health parity laws we're, we're trying to come to get some help with that. Unfortunately, um, as we all know, you know, uh, even the best uh, made laws still have loopholes and, and problems with them. So one of the things I, um, when I was still working for a, a large healthcare system, what was finding is that <clears throat> even though, you know, health parity is supposed to be on the books as far as a law from insurance providers, a lot of times folks would be, again, we're all interested in saving a buck when they sign up for stuff. You know, they say, you know, you can, um, when talking to the person that, that's uh, selling them the insurance, you know, well, you can save this much money if you, you know, if you um, don't need this or if you only need this. And a lot of times, a lot of the times, one of the first things on the chopping block is, oh, yeah, you don't need mental health coverage. You don't need inpatient mental health care. You don't need substance use um, coverage. That is a big chunk of stuff you can save money on. And of course, it's one of those things like most insurances, we don't need it until we need it. Um, and so then when folks actually needed it and they, they came up trying to find resources, they were uh, unfortunately hitting a, a brick wall because of that. In addition to, because of a uh, long held stigma from, from even the medical community as far as what um, the mental health professions, psychologists, psychiatrists, um, counselors do, um, not gonna lie, reimbursement is also uh, an issue. Um, and so, like we were saying, you know, seeing mental health is, is equal to physical health, you know, the, the perception that, oh, it's easier, you don't need as much work, it's you know simpler, so uh, anybody can do it kind of stuff, also has reimbursement effects. So folks that go into it, um, you know, sometimes struggle to, to figure out how they can make it because the, um, the insurance panels that they do may, uh, may take um, don't uh, reimburse very well. So then what happens when they go? Um, not taking insurance just to say, okay, I wanna make sure I'm, I'm for you, the patient. And then I'll, that also has, has problems. So there's, yes, there's a lot of systemic um, issues with, uh, with access to care. No, agreed. And I mean, it's an inherently antagonistic system with, you know, private healthcare insurers and, you know, care providers. They don't, they, they want to keep the money and, and, and share with their stock, their, their stockholders. So it's, it is inherently antagonistic. It does not want the, the, the money they received and, and pre, you know, and, and, and our premiums do not want to be, they don't want to pay out. So it's inherently antagonistic. And so as long as that is the way it is, I just expect more of this. Mental health parity laws were enacted in 08, but they're, they're, they're toothless. They're, they're, they're toothless. So they're unenforced. They're unenforced. And what I've seen, what I've seen over the last 20 years or so is just insurers just move away from, you know, plans that provide any kind of service and just shift it all to catastrophic type things with high deductibles per families and that early that families start paying out after some huge deduct deductible is met, usually in some crisis or an emergency type thing. So there's just more of that. The, 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 what, what I've done and what I see happening, I mean, I, I just liberated myself from the managed care setup and just accepted patients fee for service. I don't charge what my counterpart could charge in another city or state. I, I keep my prices pretty fair. And it ends up almost being the same. And that's, that's, that's what I've done. And I watch other, I mean, and, that's, and I can do that in psychiatry because I don't have to have an MRI, you know, machine in my office, not to have, you know, all these things, but, but that can work. But I see other, I mean, I see general medical providers doing the same thing. And I see a shift away from large hospital systems into smaller groups. And even you know, they're negotiating with, you know, managed care carriers to be, you know, in a, in a more beneficial way to them. And, and I, think that's, I think that's where things are going. So um, it's messy, it's clunky. And again, it's inherently adversarial. And we're just, you know, it's the system we have. 
right now, regrettably. How about over with Kimberly? You mentioned that you have EAP contracts. How does that work? And is that a little more a medical? No, it's extremely clunky, clunky as well. Um, I wish it was more even um, streamed, but it's not. Um, basically, the EAP provider will contact, so I'm on a panel, and the company will contract with certain people that are on panels. Um, the referral comes in from a case manager. Uh, the case manager assigns the patient to the uh, correct or a good match for a clinical provider. Um, typically, you're looking at anywhere from two to four sessions, and at that point, you're making a quick evaluation, you're working with a client and identifying specific treatment goals, um, what the client wants to have and uh, achieve by the time treatment's over with. So you're not doing an in-depth, you know, uh, psychoanalysis. It is crisis-oriented, it's brief treatment, um, it's a scratch on the surface. Um, so you're just trying to basically put a band-aid on kind of what's going on and, and really setting the, the client up for having some concrete skills and coping strategies that, that they can actually, you know, set forth and implement. Um, and then we're either looking at a referral to a lawn care provider or a psychiatrist um, if they need medication because you're ruling that out during the course of the treatment. Or you're taking a look at, you know, offering the client most of the time they don't want to go and see another provider because they're starting all over again. And so they want to stick with you. And so then it's a, a matter of navigating uh, what does that look like. Um, and sometimes it works out favorably and other times, um, you know, you're scrambling and trying to make referrals to, uh, you know, that's where a lot of colleagues come in place and I can give a brief over treatment and the client will trust me enough to say, okay, you know, you know, this person, I'm just not going to some random, you know, clinic that you don't know someone. So there's hopefully a personable, um, smooth transition to make that referral. So yeah, to answer your question, Pastor Scott, it, it's still very clunky. Um, you know, it's limited sessions, which, you know, you can only do so much. Um, and, you know, I, I think if anything, a lot of times people are paying for an EAP that they're not even aware of. So that would be the first thing that I would absolutely advise people that if you are working for a company, does your company have an EAP provider? Um, is that a resource that you have? Um, a lot of times people come in and they were referred by, you know, a coworker mentioned because they utilized it. And it was just in talking and, you know, the, at the water bubbler, <laughs> you know, at the, and getting some coffee or a water and, you know, people have started connecting and, um, oh yeah, I've used the EAP. You don't know about the EAP. And so a lot of times that's how people are, you know, coming in, um, not even really knowing that it's available. Let, let me ask you, uh, you say that you're on a panel. Does that mean you're on a list of, of approved providers? Yes, that's correct. It's a list of approved providers. Um, the case manager, when a referral comes in from a company, they look through their providers. I'm a Christian counselor, so that's, you know, a distinguished um, kind of attribute. Um, they may want a female provider. They may want a male provider. They may want a provider that is specialized in CBT therapy or specific therapies that um, would be a good match for the client. Y'all think we're over medicated in the United States? I think we're 20% of the population in the United States takes some type of antipsychotic medication. This is a, I've been talking about it as well, typically. So, um, from my my own training, um, uh, like Patrick said, done in MUC, so there was a, a time when when the divergent um, psychiatry, as far as the, the uh, biological emphasis versus the, the kind of psychological emphasis. Um, and there's a revolution with, with medications. Oh, again, I think our table was talking about that. Hey, there's a medication for this now. Great. We'll just throw that at you. Open your mouth and we'll just dump it in. <clears throat> um, obviously, they're effective. They can be helpful. Um, but as I, as I even mentioned here and, and, and say all the time, they're not the end-all be-all. They can be helpful and they can have a time and a place. Um, but some folks can, you know, be treated um, uh, perfectly well without medications. Um, but again, unfortunately, I think it taps into our society's uh, mindset of the quick fix. You know, is there something that I can just take? I, I don't want to put in the work to go to EAP or go to therapy and actually 
talk about my feelings. Um, I instead just want the medication. I want that that quick thing that's going to make me feel better and go on my way. Um, we were talking about you know, um, some references to mommy's little helper kind of stuff back in the day. Um, so I do think there is a portion of that where it is um, overutilized. But I also think on the flip side of that coin is that, again, like um, uh, most things, now that we have less stigma and are talking about it more, more folks are coming um, to, to seek help and that we're actually then being appropriately able to um, offer help in, in different manners. And so it comes then back down to when is it appropriate? When do we need and how long and what the medication is um, and what additional things can we be doing to help folks? Again, I, I keep saying over and over again, I'm a huge proponent of psychotherapy in addition to um, stuff sometimes. Um, or that's that's all somebody needs um, uh, for certain certain uh, entities. Now, there's other things that absolutely you know um, are necessary to make sure somebody has a quality of life and function. Um, but uh, again, I think uh, we do have a tendency as Americans to quickly, um, even as physicians, I'll be the first one to say I'm hairy carrying myself in the physicianhood of reaching for that prescription pad. Um, and that goes back into what um, the Lord was saying a minute ago too, as far as the pressures uh, and the time constraints, and especially our, um, I love my primary care physicians and provider folks that now only have like five, 10 minutes with somebody. And it's like, uh, here, because um, that's all I, you know, the time I've got is to be able to do that instead of, okay, let me take the time. Let me listen to what's going on. Let me have this, this longer appointment. And I think that's, it goes back into um, direct primary care and those kinds of DPC services coming away from that that can be helpful. Um, so long and short, yes and no. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. It's like I just answered. Sure. And, and it's yes and no. Probably too many walking well people probably taking things that they don't need. Just there's just a good amount of that. There's a thing in the world called de-prescribing, and it's something that I do. Probably most most addiction providers will do that. We'll take people off of things to kind of clarify ongoing need and whatnot. So plenty of that. But there's folks too who, who really need them and are not getting them. You know, I'll be stopped at a stoplight and there's a man at the, you know, panhandling who's talking to talking to this guy. And he needs he needs to be on an act team with some injectable long acting antipsychotic or something. And clearly he's not getting it. So there's there's those folks too. And they're 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 homeless and they're in our jails and they're in other places. So they are they need the medicine, don't have it. And conversely, many people take and probably don't need them. So yes and no. Yeah. One of the new trends coming out of, of the pandemic, and all of being locked in and everything, is, is that a lot of people have shifted over to searching for mental health. But that put a big burden on mental health providers. And they have started to, to suffer just burnout more frequently. How have you seen that? Uh, and you, you guys are here, so I don't know the questions. But, uh, but how have you seen that in your practice, and how have you seen that, that uh, in your colleagues? Well, for, for, for me, myself, um, I, there was a time when I, I actually added hours to, to meet the need um, for a little for months, and, and that was bad for me. Like I realized I, I couldn't do that. I, I can't do I can't do the same hours I did when, <laughs> when I was younger. just can't do it. So uh, I, I, I saw, I, I tried to meet the need and tried to, you know, rescue and do all these things that I'm supposed to do and ended up hurting me. And it was a hard lesson. It was a, it was a good lesson because I, you know, I met my master on that one. You know, I can't do that many hours. I can't see that many people in one day. And so it was, it, it was a good lesson. You have to learn to take care of yourself and all of this. And so I'm, I'm, I'm doing that. So hobbies, I've, I've got new hobbies, like my, my buddy back there, Dave Deeds, will, will, will tell you about one of them. But, you know, so I've got new hobbies and I see friends and do things and take care of myself and enjoy that good stuff. And something I brought up earlier too, and I really mean it, I try to encourage everybody, every chance I get, something encouraging, there's something happening. I can be useful somewhere, some small thing. Even if, even if I... If I can't see that person, I'll suggest something else that, that would be helpful. So it's just something small, but it really, it, it, up, it uplifts me in all of this mess. 
and I look for for good things to share every every chance that I get with somebody. Like for instance, if I'm having a follow-up meeting with somebody and I hear things are just the same, I'll say that's awesome <laughs> because things, you know what I mean? Like hey, it's really great to be holding your own right now. You know what I mean? So you know, like just little things like that. You know, like hey, Doc, we're making it. We're doing good. You know, still married. And I'm like, hey, that's great. Congratulations. This is an A plus. You know what I mean for a young married couple who just got married during COVID. You know, like A plus. This this year counts for five. You know what I mean. <laughs> so, um, anyways, that's one way I do it. That's one way I handle it. But um, definitely, we've been hearing across the board, uh, not just in mental health, but um, healthcare uh, workers in general, uh, the burnout. Um, it's real. Um, and even, it was present even before the, the pandemic, especially in the mental health side of things, because as I've been saying, such a need, uh, but there's, there's, so, there's so few folks. Um, and that's why I always encourage you things like this uh, as far as awareness. And also for the, 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 the two over there as well, I'm um, interested in going to, to the mental health. I know Sally won't want, that's not going to be for you guys, but encouraging and, and teaching um, the, the new generations to, to consider mental health careers as well. Um, yes, and it, it's important for us to have boundaries and, and um, for ourselves. And that, that can, because we all go into this with that cliche, I just want to help folks. Uh, mentality, right? Um, but uh, as always, tell folks to you, obviously you can't help other folks if your own uh, picture is, is empty. Um, and so having to, to find ways of, of refilling your own, and sometimes that's a challenge because we really want to help folks. Um, and sometimes bend over backwards and do more and say yes more than we, we should. Um, and then when we do say no, then we really feel guilty because uh, that person really needs us. And, um, we either get the, the, the death stare or the, the guilt trip or otherwise, but um, it's not out of malice. You know, we're, we're just trying to make sure we're, we're able to help as many folks as we can too. Um, so I'm not sure if that answered your question, but yes, it's real. It's definitely there. Um, and you know, there's, there, there's, there's folks that, um, uh, that have been, been trying to fight this as well. Right. Thanks, and I just, I just thought of something else. Talk about stigma and awareness. I think it was Friday, this past Friday. It was Physician Suicide Awareness Day. I think. Yeah, I, I, I should have, I, I should know, <laughs> but I, I, I think, I think that's right. It didn't really get, it didn't really get a lot of media play, but you know, <laughs> we, we, there's a lot of suicide in our in our profession, but medicine in general, and. Again, I could be wrong. I'm gonna out now. I'm gonna go check my phone the minute I get out of here and see if it was Friday or not. But anyway, so things like that, and so and there was um, this like there was a physician suicide, uh, like a physician um, burnout kind of uh, volunteer line that got started by a bunch of psychiatrists. And they are actively seeking volunteers right now, and I almost threw my back in and said I'm gonna get in, but I'm like I got I got plenty of people. I got plenty to do right now, so I reckon I build. But there are people who are crisis. There's like you know crisis psychiatry. And there's folks who are trained in it, and so they're organizing people. They're teaching them to kind of man these hotlines for people to get off the. You know when they get off their shift, they can just kind of really. It's really just a lot of ventilation. They're just letting them talk, having get stuff off their chest, and there's there's tremendous value in that. So that that's happened during the pandemic. That has sprung up. I, mean, I have a colleague. I have a psychiatrist colleague in the community, female, who began a uh, program, um, a cognitive behavioral th theory oriented, uh, th therapy oriented uh, program for female psychiatrists or female physicians to prevent burnout. So that's, um, so some people are just taking initiative of making their own thing. Some people are joining these na like local, so there's, there's nationwide things that have kind of sprung up around this too. So that's, that's certainly happening. I, I see a lot of people who are physicians and, and you know, other healthcare providers. And so I'm really keenly, you know, monitoring their, their burnout status, you know, and finding ways to help them take breaks. Just like these gentlemen mentioned, I think, you know, just being able to be aware, self-aware of when you are getting to that point of burnout, because we do, we want to help the masses, right? Um, we want to be available. 
Um, for myself, uh, we have a Charlotte local program unit here for uh, social workers. So I've been actively involved. I've been on the board since 2009. Um, and we do ongoing continuing ed, but we also have meetings in regards to being able to support each other. So I think it's a matter of really relying on colleagues and, you know, um, being able to acknowledge that, hey, I've got this case, I don't know where to go with it, what are your thoughts, um, and being able to, you know, bounce ideas off of each other. I, I've taken up meditation through the course of this pandemic, which I didn't ever think I was going to be able to calm my mind down, but that's been something that I've been really clinging to um, over the course of this um, pandemic, trying to just manage myself so that we can give the best care to our, our patients. And I'll just say one thing, like during this pandemic, like it has, and we're, we're a church, so I can talk about this. I mean, my my faith life has taken off, like my Bible studies taken off, I share the gospel randomly with people now. So, you know, the bad stuff here, you know, teaches us to, you know, the bad stuff that happens to me or the bad stuff on here in, in earth, it just teaches me to look up, look to heaven, look for Christ look, you know, and what, what, you know, how, you know, how does Christ figure into this weird thing going on right now, you know, and so, I mean, for, for me, this is what, I mean, this is, people ask, how, how do you do it? Well, you know, boundaries and hobbies and fun, but in all, in all seriousness, like, I've really taken this, I've really taken my, my faith to the next level, and it was so sad, there was a weekend plan this weekend to bring Christ to a bunch of men, pilgrims, and uh, it got canceled because of COVID, but you know, it'll be another one, and I'll I'll be I'll, I'll be part of it. And um, so, you know, this earth is you know always had problems, <laughs> and there's there's always been an answer in my mind. Well, this has been great, and I want to appreciate and thank the panel for fielding these questions here. Um, Two things. First of all, if this has really kind of sparked an interest or an initiative within you, um, you know, here at Christ Lutheran, we've got a great saying, you're it. Um, if God is moving your spirit to go a deeper level with this, um, this is what we ask. You find maybe two or three more people who share that passion and that you come to uh, probably me or one of the pastors here and say, we would like to take it to the next level. Maybe something like United Methodist Church is doing. Maybe it's something of some support groups for people going through different, whether it's children or marriage or depression or whatever else. We will help you advertise it. We will help you get resources for it. We will get facility space for it. And we'll help you with your ministry to be able to go to that next level. So if you're interested, if it's moving, get a couple more people and say, Scott, we're in. Second thing is that we're doing it again next month. This is a monthly thing. So it's going to be in October. What's the date again? Maybe October 9th here. And we have Thrive School. Thrive School is for um, children on the spectrum or maybe Downs or whatever special needs that they might have. They're at all three campuses now. It's exciting. We have maybe 60 kids on the three campuses here that are going uh, part of our Thrive. And so we're going to have the Thrive School directors and some of the teachers talk about how we are being intentionally inclusive because those families have felt very much um, not welcomed. My child may have an outburst. My child may not be able to sit still long enough for Sunday school. My child is just different. And so we're trying to be much more inclusive. October 9th, we'll do it again. October 10th. October 10th. Thank you. Thank you, October 10th. Anything else? Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, you have called us to go to the highways and to the byways to be able to include those who don't feel like they're on the A-list, the stigma or separation, or they just don't feel as if they belong. Lord, let this be a place of belonging and use us here to be able to welcome those who feel on the outside 
that here is a place of belonging. For these things we lift up in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you for the desserts. Got a couple left over. You can grab one for home. And thanks for those who are online. So good to have you. Thank you all for your time. Thank you, Chris.